Um, so today we have Sebastian who will be telling us about the topology of tiling spaces. Right, yes, hello. So I should first thank uh, Sarah for the invitation to speak. Uh, so very kind, I get to talk about my pet topic, which is fun. Now this, this isn't a research talk, this is just me talking about an error that I, that I, I quite like. Um, so yeah, I, I can't see any, any people's faces. So if you have any questions, just, just shout out. And can, you can all see my, my slides and my cursor, just waving it around. Yeah, I'm assuming that's a yes. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. So it's just, this is just gonna be a fun expository thing. And I guess the, the story of the fun stuff really starts in the 1970s with, with, with Roger Penrose and stuff. Anyway, let's, let's see what we're gonna be talking about. So um, I'm going to quickly define tilings and, and you have to be a little bit careful with it. So we'll, we'll see that and we'll go through some properties and then we'll talk about what a tiling space actually is and cohomology and then and some other stuff. So let's go for it. Right, so. So yeah, this is the definition of a tiling. Uh, you, ha you can set up in very various different ways. You can say that your, your tiles, you can say that they want to be a uh, you know, a homeomorphic to a closed unit ball or whatever. But the idea is we're just going to divide up Euclidean space into, into a tiling in, 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 the, in the intuitive fashion. And in the literature, by the way, it's, it's always RD rather than RN. And just to tidy things up, let's, let's um, be clear about what we mean for something to be sort of well behaved. So a tiling is simple if there are only finite many tile types up to translation and each one is called a prototile, and each tile is a polytope, and they meet full edge to full edge. Just very, very simple stuff, all intuitive. And we're not thinking about rotations in this talk. Well, I'll mention the rotations at the end, but uh, we're just going to be thinking about translation. And uh, tilings are always just going to be, when I say a tiling T, I mean a tiling T of RD. And that's just going to be that. So for, for tiling T, read tiling T of ID. So, just a few examples of things we can cook up. So for, this is just an example of a substitution. So uh, it's called the Fibonacci substitution for a, for a slightly subtle reason. But I, I substitute, I have two letters in my alphabet and I go from A to AB and B to A. And you can translate this into a one dimensional tiling. You have a, an A tile and a B tile. And you divide up your, your real line with tilings of length one for a B tile and length uh, golden ratio, one plus root five over two for your A tile. And at this, and uh, yes, so this is just an example of how you go when you iterate it. Uh, and here we have a chair tiling, which is just a, you know, you, you divide up your, your smaller tile and you inflate and then you divide up that again and you inflate. And that's the general idea of how you generalize this and make it formal. So you, you sort of, you have a divide and inflate map. So you have your, for each type of tile, each proto tile, you, you divide things up into smaller copies of your, of your, you know, your prototiles, and then you inflate by a constant. So for the Fibonacci example, you have tiles of length uh, golden ratio and one, and you substitute A goes to AB, and you inflate by a scale factor of the golden ratio, and that works because um, uh, tau squared is tau plus one. And here in the chair tiling, it's it's a uh, it's a scale factor of two. And you might be be saying, ah, but Sebastian, this this isn't a simple tiling. Well but because you have a tilings here, tiles here that don't match full edge to full edge. But if you consider this, this L as a degenerate octagon with, with, a, with a two extra vertices halfway along these two longer sides, then, then you can cheat and you can make it work. So it's fine. This other one is, is a, another way we can cook up a tiling. It's cut and project. So we start with, in this case, a, just an integer grid of, of R2. So this is Z2 and R2. And I, I, I slice through it at somehow an irrational angle or any angle for that matter, but if we want something interesting, this angle sort of has to be irrational. And I, I make a, a orthogonal set of, you know, line set of axes and I take a sort of what I call an acceptance domain in here. And then whenever you see I point inside this domain, I project downwards and I get, you know, uh, this, you know, a set of points and I, I call the gaps between the points tiles and, uh, this will turn out if this angle is irrational, this will give you something that's that's called aperiodic, which is what we see in the next slide. So here, I just want to introduce some notation. Um, 
you get a small problem if uh, uh, you got a you got a small problem with just things getting very messy and definitions in general looking a little bit nasty. Um, but uh, I'm just going to stick this out there and also, uh, yeah, is this this is just really a, just a patch of of radius r. So I'm looking at all the tiles that are sort of distance r from the origin. And uh, there, there's a picture on the next slide uh, that will explain things a bit better. But the um, I don't have an iPad with an Apple Pencil. I mean, this talk lends itself to, to, to being drawn so much, you know, really nicely, but unfortunately I can't do that. Um, so here are some desirable properties anyway. So A periodicity, this is, this is very much a, a global property. If I translate my, my tile by a vector X, I want it to match the original tiling if and only if X is zero. So this is, you know, if I, if I have my tiling of say a flat plane and I take some tracing paper over it and I draw my tiles and then I, move my tracing paper around, I never want it to match. And again, this is only translation. We're not thinking about, excuse me, we're not thinking about uh, rotations at all. And repetitivity sort of, it seems like it's kind of a, in a, at odds with this aperiodicity um, thing just by the name of it, but they, they can coexist. And uh, what I'm just saying here is that, you know, for all, every small patch of tiles, it, there, I'm guaranteed to find it in some bigger patch of tiles. And that's all that is. And this finite local complexity, which I'll often abbreviate to FLC, that's why they're bold, uh, is just, I want finitely many sort of um, equivalence classes of, of patches after translation. And the, the slogan here, yeah, not, not completely random nor completely symmetric. I, I want something interesting, uh, but not, not just completely random. I, I want it to have interesting properties and that way we can have fun understanding it. And so I, hear, I have an obligatory picture of a, uh, of a Penrose tiling. You can't do a talk about tilings without mentioning this, but you can see sort of what I mean. And th this tiling is aperiodic. Um, it's, it's, it's a really, really beautiful construction. As I said, this sort of came up as recreational math mathematics in, in the 70s and has since become a lot more, uh, you know, less recreational and more concrete. Um, but yeah, you see th this little patch in the middle, this sort of uh, five-pointed star uh, repeats a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm just saying that for any you know, small patch of tiles or you know, arbitrarily large patch of tiles, there's an even bigger patch of tiles in which it's guaranteed to, to repeat. And this is, this, is a, this is a local property, but it's somehow expressed somehow glo globally. And, uh, and yeah, final local complexity just means when I, when I, I have finally many patches up to translation because the, the main thing is that when I translate, even though they're congruent, they're, they're, they're still considered the same under this equivalence. Cool. So this is a definition of a metric on tilings. So I'm, I'm saying here that this, this root two is just, just here for, it's arbitrary. It's, it's, it's a small thing, relatively small thing that is just helps you make sure things converge in a nice way. Um, but I, I'm saying two tilings are somehow epsilon close. If epsilon is tiny, that if they agree up to a large distance from the origin, up to some small epsilon translation, that's all I'm saying there. And I, I define the tiling space of, of a tiling T just, just to be the, uh, the completion of the set of all translations of this tiling completed with this metric. That's, that's all that is. But th this, this has lots of interesting properties and we, we want to somehow understand what this 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 tiny space tells us about the tiling and, and all this sort of interesting stuff. And that that's really what this talk is going to be about, understanding this omega t, this this tiny space. So examples. So if I start with just a tiling of unit intervals of, of the real line, if tr translating by you know one is the same as translating by any integer. So what I get here is my tiling space just becomes a circle, right? I, I I identify um, all, the trans all the translated copies of my tiling T and I just get a circle. And in general, if, if I have a, a, uh, a tiling of, of, of RD by, uh, uh, by, by D cubes, you know, say R2 by I tile by squares, like your normal favorite bathroom tiling. If, if I tile RD by, by D dimensional cubes, then I'll get a D torus as, as my, my tiling space. And the next one is, is half and half. So I, I have half uh, black tiles and half red tiles. And, uh, and this is the origin in the middle. Um, 
so if I translate infinitely to the right, I'm going to get just a, a tiling of just all you know, intervals that have this label black. And if I say into I to the left, then they're all going to have the label red and it's just, that's just going to be an infinite, you know, so it's, it's going to look like two copies of, of this circle we had before, but there's a sort of a, a sort of a, a spiral that goes asymptotically up, up to each one. And uh, it, this is an interesting space. Uh, there's there's uh, some interesting things going on. And, uh, you know, I encourage you guys to think about it. Oh, inc incidentally as well, this, this, this half and half tiling isn't um, repetitive because of this patch in the middle, this, this black red is not repeated anywhere else. So, so this, this, this violates repetitivity. And um, just in the off chance anyone gets bored, um, I, I, if perhaps you'd like to think about the, uh, the tiling space of an infinite chessboard. You know, that's always a rather fun one to think about. It's a, it's a good problem. Uh, so some facts. Um, yeah, simple tiling of RD, then omega T is compact. Right. Uh, the, the way the way you prove this is is you 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 work by sequential sequential um, compactness, right? You you give yourself a a, a sequence of uh, of of tilings, and then then you 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 use that you because it's simple, everything's a polytope, so you know polytopes are compact. So so I I use that uh, I can just you know find one with where the origin always converges into some some single tile and then I can just build out. So then I can look at all the neighboring tiles of that and build another subsequence and keep going and going and going. And it, you, can, you can prove that uh, it will be sequential. You'll have a convergent subsequence and, and everything's good. And just another quick definition. Uh, a tiling space is minimal uh, when you have dense orbits under the action of RD. Again, just, just by translation. And uh, a tiling space is minimal if and only if T is repetitive. And uh, th this this is is very simple to prove. It's it's a good exercise. If um, if t, t is repetitive, is that's that's uh, more or less encodes this this minimality because you have these big patches containing your smaller patches, and it all works. And then just just one ma the major theorem about this stuff is is if if you have a I guess sufficiently interesting tiling repetitive a periodic that, that is as FLC, so it has all three. Uh, then up to homomorphism, it's a, it's a Cantor set fiber over a D torus, and the, the way this arises is so locally, your your every point of your tiling space is 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 a tiling. It's 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 a it's a moduli space, right? So if if I um uh, translate uh, just around by R D, that's that's like a, a local like a local D disk, and then from from a, a finite patch, I have infinitely many discrete choices of how I want to uh, to tile out. Uh, the, the the rest of of d dimensional space, and that gives gives me the Cantor set. So that that's that's the main thing there. I'll just are there any questions so far? I'll just pause quickly. I'll take that as a no. Um, so how do how do we study these things? So homology and homotopy don't really help us because, as I say here. Uh, the, the the orbit under translation by RD is 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 uh, uh, excuse me each path component is is a is a t of a tiny space is uh, an orbit under translation by by RD and th these are all contractible so this just immediately gives you that the homotopy groups are useless and therefore also homology groups are useless and uh, so we've got to go with cohomology and we we can ex exploit a limit structure which we'll see on the on the next slide that is just going to be uh, Using this, using check cohomology, we can do that. And the other approach is is to use a kind of a use functions and use a Durham like approach. So that that's all good. So tilings is inverse limits. So g given a, a tiling T, we, we can, you know, we 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 can see in, intuitively how it might be built as an inverse limit. So if you start with with your 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 single tile at the origin. And uh, then, then you look at the layer of tiles that are immediately neighboring that, and then you look at the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. You you have an inverse limit, um, and uh, we can we can generalize that in, in, to to uh, to thinking about tiling spaces in general. The, the argument is 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 quite subtle, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, but the idea is that you you get um, uh, complexes uh, gamma k, where you, you glue together the edges of tiles in a, in a clever way. And uh, you, uh, 
are able to get a complexes which 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 uh, which uh, the inverse limit gives you the tiling space, and the, so we're going to reduce the problem to a very simple calculation of just of just limits. Um, and for substitutions, it, this this is a great idea. The only thing is that we need it to force the border, and what this means is that after a uh, I, I have a, a, a tiling forces the border. If if I have a, if there's a number n such that if I iterate my substitution n times, I'm I'm guaranteed to know what the border of the um of of this this nth substitution, well all all the tiles bordering this 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 nth substitution will look like. Um, uh, given the tiling, given the tiles that I started iterating on, so it's just all the neighboring tiles. Of, if you think in in two dimensions, um, if if I you know iterate my substitution lots, and I should be able to just just to know be able to deduce immediately what what the tiles around it are. And yeah, so here we are. We translate uh, tiny t into a sequence of cell complexes in 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 this way, but not I'll well, I'll explain the way in a minute. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to do this by an example. So we have to uh, work with with things that are called collared tiles in in the case of Fibonacci substitution, which I gave an example of earlier because it does not force the border. So the the idea is to um, create a a, a a a complex by by gluing together tiles in such a way that they they are glued together that it it um, remembers how tiles can can link together. When when you uh, um, when you're looking at the rules of how the tiles can neighbor each other, and it it, uh, it only converges to the uh, the tiling space if if you if you uh, oh, if it forces the border. If it doesn't force the border, you have to use collar tiles. And this is just we we make new tiles out of the, the set of uh, not the set. You make new tiles out of um, the tiles that neighbor them. So I take this patch of the Fibonacci substitution, and I have these four possible colored tiles, and I just get this. I, you know, it, this this loss of A's and B's becomes B C A B D B C B A C A, and and then we get complexes like this. So an a, a and B can always be together, A and A can always be together, but B and B can't be together. And the direction for the arrow, remember this. And then on on this side, we it's a bit more complicated, but we we just have that. So that's that's what the complexes look like, and uh, we can incur the substitution in a matrix, and then the the calculation just becomes a uh, a direct limit of this z two with a, and that's a, a z plus a tau z, and th this is just encoding the information that, that we already knew of having a tile of length one and of length tau, and uh, the um. This, this, yeah, we already knew this, but for things like the um, the Penrose tilings, which are which are also um, which are also uh, substitutions, then we can uh, 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 we can see that uh, H one of a Penrose tiling space is Z five, and H two is uh, Z eight, and this is encoding some uh, much more complicated structure because the Penrose tiling is is both a substitution and a cut and project, and you can project down from five dimensional Euclidean space down to three, not down to two. And yeah, there's, there's a lot going on there. And there, I have some references at the end for the for people who are interested to to, uh, to have a look. And we're, we're motoring through this. Uh, so we may well end fairly short of time. So there'll be lots of time for questions if people want to discuss this. But yes, the problem with, with this, um, this uh, approach is that we get, yes we have we know very little about the generators. We'd like to know what the cohomology of a um, of a tiny space looks like and how it reflects the the structure more more concretely in a sense. I mean this has given us a, a lot of this has given us a way to calculate and the the way we're going to describe shortly is by no means easier, but it will help us see what's going on. So I I want to talk about things called pattern equivariant func functions. So um, a, f a function from R D to R, R or R D is pattern equivariant if it's just uh, if it's just uh, you know wherever two patches of tiles agree, then my function agrees also. That that's that's all that we want, and hence the name pattern equivariant. And so I I want my 
I, I write T equivariant when I mean pattern equivariant with respect to a tiny T. And uh, uh, the T equivariant arrays are, I denote by this, and the, the strongly T equivariant stuff is just this, this, this massive union. And um, they're, they're weakly if they're uniform limits of, of strongly T equivariant maps. So uh, yeah, you, you, when you modify the theory for, for R or RD, it, it, it checks out um, both, both, both of these um, work for what I'm going to say. Um, but yes, you, you get a subcomplex of the Durham complex on RD, uh, and you, you, you define the cohomology of this. Do we write it like that? And th this, this works just like you want it to. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, differential on a, on a pattern equivariant function is also pattern equivariant. So this, this, this absolutely works and it, it, all, it all checks out. So this, this gives a uh, cohomology isomorphic to the uh, check cohomology of my uh, omega T with real coefficients. So this is great. I mean, it, this, this is just telling us exactly what we wanted. And uh, yeah, and there's a corollary, corollary if T is repetitive, then, then you have this and this this is because of um, orbits of t prime will be will be dense in omega t and you just have a string of uh, uh, this t prime is is isomorphic to to uh, h h check star of omega t prime with r and that's isomorphic to h check star of omega t and then you just have that it's just a straight thing. Yeah, so in the theorem, is it the h star p of t, is that easier to compute or is it just like overall like kind of equal on the two sides? Uh, easy to compute in what sense, sorry? Uh, like if, if you have your tiling, like is it typically easier to compute the cohomology on one side of the equivalence or another? Oh, I see. Um, it depends entirely on your tiling, to be honest, because your your if I just go back, your 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 pattern air covariant functions can can be can be super nasty, you know, and in uh, arbitrary. Um, if if your tiling is 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 nice enough to be able to compute um, this this as a as a as a limit as we described earlier, then of course you go this way. And um, but yeah, it's 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 these aren't really computational tools. These are these are theoretical ones. Okay, thanks. And uh, just, just as, a, as a sort of hint on what is possible for us to eventually do next um, when we're looking at uh, relations between tiling spaces, um, uh, tiling T is locally derivable if I, wherever um, tiling it agrees on T prime, then it, 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 T is, is forced to agree. And uh, and this this has uh, implications for uh, T equivariant. So this just this also it also sort of links up with with this corollary, and you're having two uh, tilings, and you can have the cohomology of one contained with the other. Or if, if it's repetitive, then you immediately have this. Yeah, so it's it's all good. So I mean we're we're pretty much at the end, uh, except that I'm going to go through a little bit more and uh, uh, and where to go next, and then I'm going to give some references for people who are, who might uh, be interested. But yes, given a homeomorphism between two tiling spaces, I, I omit the T here just just if, if, just because um, between two tiling spaces, and under some conditions we can decompose it. And so this 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 phi is a um, is a local derivation equivalence in in the in the sense here. It just it's just a, a morphism that it, uh, respects this. And uh, this HSC is a shape change, which is uh, I literally just changed the shape of my prototiles going from uh, space to space. And then this this tau s is called a quasi translation, and that's just um, any translation that is uh, homotopic to the identity. So in under certain nice conditions, you you you, you have this, and this this is to do with um, tiny spaces being. Um, uh, being dynamic, dynamical systems as well, especially substitutions. So if you have, uh, if it's uniquely ergodic and various other things, I think minimal as well, you, you get this. And uh, it's, it's, it's certainly non-trivial. I mean, this, this was a paper, I think in 2012, which I, th I think I mentioned later. Um, but yes, and we can consider rotations. I, I said earlier that we, we weren't thinking about them, but we can we can redevelop our theory and we get many different tonic spaces. We have the one under translation, one under rotation, and one, one with both. And uh, uh, this is just uh, 
when settling things like the Penrose tonics, which have a five-fold rotational symmetry, then then this yields some interesting results. Um, but the the theory is is a not what I've looked at before. Um, that's why I'm not talking about it. Uh, so yes, many many other tricks are studying tonings without finite local complexity. This has been a sort of implicit assumption in most of what we've been talking about. Um, and this is some very active ongoing research and there's there's some good papers in that. And the last thing that I, I want to talk about is where to go next is their relations to physics. I mean, I, I know this is this is a more or less a, a gathering of pure mathematicians, but but there, there are there are some important um, things things going on here. So uh, um, in 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 the 80s, mid 80s, there was a discovery of of things called quasi crystals, which are um, which look very much like aperiodic tiling to three dimensional space. And uh, when they were discovered by um, uh, the researchers, they, they'd seen um, pictures of Penrose tilings and thought they were pretty. And they saw some of their X-ray crystallography and thought that looked a lot like Penrose tilings. So it's, it's a classic example of science can't see what doesn't have the language to describe. You know, it, you know, it, it, you know it's, it's, it's a wonderful, um, little, little lovely coincidence that some recreational maths that Penrose was doing l led to a discovery in physics, which injected a, a fair bit of funding into mathematical understanding of, of, of tiling spaces. Um, but yes, so here, here I have yes references for the curious. This this at the top is is a is a fantastic book uh, that is, I, I recommend. E even if it's quite a slim volume, but I, if you even have a passing interest, I recommend just just having a look for it. Uh, for those of you who are ambitious, um, this Forest Hunter and Kenlong paper is is um, just is a complete massive survey of everything you can do with cut and project tilings, and it's it's absolutely mad. But it, it is it is a wonderful paper. And this Anderson and Putnam thing um, was sort of the, the first, um, it's in 1998, uh, the, the first people to uh, sort of write down down this um, uh, inverse limit approach to making your cell complexes and working it that way. They were interested in, as it says, C-star algebras and K-theory, but it, it really uh, paved the way. And uh, this 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 fourth one is, is wonderful if you're thinking about um, substitutions. And uh, this last one by Clark and Hunton is is a a, a, a lovely a lovely paper about um, uh, looking at uh, how you can decompose things as I said here. Anyway, yes, we've got through this very quickly, so we have lots of time for questions. But yes, thank you for listening. So on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Sebastian. Um, are there any questions? Well, at least I have a uh, question. Yeah. yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, hello. Yeah. Hi, hi, Sebastian. I was uh, wondering if if there is some relation between other uh, cohomologies. For I I don't know what what uh, what terminology you use. What you were trying to compute. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? I think your your internet uh, went a bit there. Oh, uh, yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so are we talking was, about this slide? Are we? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. So I was wondering if there is any connection with other cohomology theories. Other cohomology theories. Yeah. Well, so th these are uh, very much the, the the simplest two that you you can consider, right? When thinking about these 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 Cantor set fibers over 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 D tori, um, so you you can you can mess. Uh, you know, we have this inverse limit structure, and we, and we have we can think about um, path neck as, as as we did, uh, albeit briefly. Um, I mean, you can mess around with. I think you can mess around with PV cohomology in a in a in a in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, but generally, generally speaking, I mean, it's it's a hard problem um, to 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 try and work out what what the hell these these spaces look like. Uh, um, so I'm, I there isn't really uh, it's it's a it's a very good question. I'm not sure I can really provide a satisfactory answer. So uh, you don't you have yeah, to I mean, talk to. A... Yeah, it is. I mean, I was just thinking that, uh, like uh, we can also so. So these are so so these tiles in in whatever space like R N or R D they 
sure. we, we, we we can th- think them as as uh, as a uh, type of CW complexes. Ah, right. Yes. So and th- this this is this is an idea that has been. So this this idea leads to pattern echo variant cohomology. It's the same thing. You're thinking of it as a, as a CW decomposition of of your Euclidean space. Uh, Okay. Uh, leads to this, but when and it's isomorphic to to this guy, but with integral coefficients. Okay, and uh, yeah. I, I, I I'm not sure, but I have uh, my intuition says that it it may have some connection with cellular cohomology, because we can put uh, 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 sure. what, what do we call a uh, delta complex structure on on these tilings. Yes. We can think them as as uh, I don't know one cell or or yeah. if we yeah so it's, yeah so yeah so basically my question was is is there any other nice way because this pattern equivalent cohomology seems quite I I don't know for some reason quite complicated in the beginning I was wondering if mm-hmm. if there is a well, you know so nice the, the reason we can consider it is to um. Is on our quest to try and understand what, how, how these cohomology rings are generated. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's certainly a, a good question. There's been lots of meaningful work done on it. And I, I think to an extent, you get a situation very similar to what we've described here. Okay. Yeah, this makes sense. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sarah, did you have a question? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, so I, I expect this is probably addressed further in your the second reference you listed. But I was wondering uh, yeah. if you could say anything about what like the geometry of a cut and project tiling shows up in the cohomology. Um, like, yeah, I don't know if you can say anything about that. Yeah, so so wh- when I when I was last looking at this stuff hard, um, I was really focusing on 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 uh, this 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 last. Um, Things concerning this last paper, I haven't looked at cut and project tilings in, in a meaningful way for a long time. And if I can go all the way back to that little picture I had, here we go. Yeah. So, so you're so we're look, thinking about the geometry of these guys. And are, are we? Is your question like why why does it need to be aperiodic if if this if this line is at a irrational angle or or what what's uh, are we? Well, I was more wondering. So, for for the example with the A's and B's as the repetitive mm-hmm. pattern, um, how how you see like the the golden ratio uh, show up in the cohomology? I was wondering, like, do you see similar sorts of things here? Um. um well, so you, you can write down, well, you, you, you can arrange a situation just like this where you do get a Fibonacci tiling. And th- this this um, this angle here has to only be um, inverse tan of a half. And that, that's that's definitely irrational. And uh, then you get uh, golden ratio stuff showing up. Okay. Um, I, I, I can't give you any um, concrete examples for <laughs> how that sort of thing is show up. Other than to mention what I already did about the Penrose tiling, uh, that's also a cut and project, and you get a, a Z5 in H, H1 and a Z8 in H2, and the, the, the Z8 is 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 really oh I've gone backwards rather than forwards. Um, the, the Z8 is really what's what's saying look there's some higher structure in here, come and figure out what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, I imagine these are perhaps like a little bit more complicated to see them. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a stuff. lot of, uh, there's a lot of mysterious stuff going on. Uh, yeah, this is, this is to an extent why I didn't go too deep. Yeah. And uh, have, have sped through things fairly quickly. Yeah, no, this has been a really nice introduction. Um, the other yeah. thing I was wondering about with was, so for rotations, do people tend to think of them as like groups, ac- group action giving the rotation? Yes. Okay. Yes, they do, yeah. Um, so uh, there's there's a, a wonderful example that was thought up by uh, Conway. Yes, uh, and his is um, he had a thing called a pinwheel tiling, which, which I encourage you all to Google. It's it's so your 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 basic uh, tile is is a triangle, it's a right angle triangle of side length one two and the hypotenuse root five, and um, Conway noticed that you can decompose that into 
several copies of of a, of of tiles congruent triangles congruent to the one you started with and iterating that substitution gives you a a, a really wacky tiling that it is it's the sort of thing that's often on the, on the side of modern art buildings it's it's fantastic i really encourage you guys to look at it um uh, but it's 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 not a simple tiling because i don't meet footage to full edge it's not of finite local complexity because of the angle uh, inverse tangent of, of a half is irrational so you get every possible rotation of these tiles so if you're just thinking about it translationally you've got infinitely many tiles to start with so it's it's not good um but if you if you do think of these this tiling this tiling modulo rotation you get a lot of interesting information out of it and and the, the, um, the most of the papers are by a guy called um radin r-a-d-i-n it's not radin it's, it's, radin, it's not french um and he, he uh uh yeah he's just absolutely nails down how, how these rotational tiling spaces look so um I can't really do justice to, to what he talks about in that paper, several papers. So I, I'm just going to, uh, you're going to have to be content with me telling you that it's, it, that it's there, it exists, and it's wonderful. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, okay. yeah. Any other questions for Sebastian? All right. Uh, 